Hi, this is David Weiss of Sonic Scoop. Welcome to MixCon 2022. We're glad to be back with a great friend of MixCon, the P&E wing of the Recording Academy, which directly serves producers and audio engineers. We are gathered here today with an incredible panel to discuss take your workflow to the next level, best practices in file management. Because without smart file management, it doesn't matter how amazing your mixes are, they'll never make it to the outside world. Leading the charge into this essential know-how is Maureen Droney, Executive Director of the P&E Wing. Maureen, we're psyched to be with you for Mixcom once again. This is a group of experts only you could pull together. So thank you and take it away. Thank you, David. Today, we're going to talk about the nitty gritty of music recording. How do you manage all of the parts and pieces of a project from recording to mixing and mastering, and then end up with all of the correct versions, edits, mixes, metadata, and other information organized in a way that makes for a professionally delivered project? To delve into this, we've assembled a stellar group of producers and engineers wing members who have been generously sharing their time and energy to update a p and &E wing classic. It's the respected document titled Delivery Recommendations for Recorded Music Projects. With us are Nashville-based, six-time Grammy-nominated engineer mixer Jeff Balding, the current chair of what we call our Deliverables Committee. We also have producer, engineer, and owner of Chicago's VSOP Studios, the inimitable Matt Hennessy. We have Grammy and technical Grammy winning engineer, inventor, and educator, George Massenberg. Nashville-based engineer and audio educator extraordinaire, Leslie Richter. And Paul Willie Green Womack. Brooklyn-based record producer, audio engineer, recording artist, and educator, who's a mainstay of independent hip hop and also a governor of the Audio Engineering Society and vice chair of the New York AES section. So let's get going. My first question is, what do we mean when we say best practices in recording? And I'm gonna kick it to Jeff first as our chair. To me, this is a collection of wisdom of a wide variety of diverse base of producers, engineers, even label and our admin, of their knowledge and wisdom over the years. And wisdom is making mistakes. That's how you get wisdom. So this is a collection of a lot of wisdom that can help a lot of people out and not make the mistakes that have been made in the past. Okay. Let's hear about your daily workflow with file organization and backups and how best practices are part of that workflow. Let's start with Matt. Sure. I mean, we, uh, we work on a lot of different types of projects here. VSOP from large format tracking to mixing. It's a lot of files coming and going every day. So in terms of file intake, the first thing we do is verify that downloads are correct and then immediately start putting folder hierarchy packages together based on the, the systems that we've developed here in this, this document. That way we make sure that everything is organized in a nice, neat, clean, repeatable way. We can always find everything. We know what came in, what went out, where our sessions are, which revisions we're on. And we keep pretty detailed notes on that as we go organize those across multiple servers. And then we also run daily backups to make sure that all of our data is in three places at any given time. Two of them are off-site always as well. So beyond just doing the work itself, that's the, the setup and the, the, the backend backup that, that we look into here. Whoa, Paul. Yeah, I second everything Matt said. I try to approach everything from the idea of if someone else needs to walk in tomorrow and take over this project and can't reach me, will they be able to understand everything? If I'm on vacation, I might not want a phone call or if I'm unavailable. So everything needs to be clear and within a certain repeatable state. So whether it's I made the session today or six months from now, it's always going to be the same. So whoever looks can know what to expect. That's pretty important. I like that Paul has ambitions of being unavailable. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Who else wants to comment on your daily workflow and file organization? George? I think Paul and Matt said it all. Leslie, as an engineer and an educator, although all of you uh, do some kind of education in your lives, and many of you, it's a main part of your lives, 
What do you feel is the most challenging part of developing a workflow that incorporates best practices? It's tough to get people to understand why it's important because it just seems like a lot of uh, busy work and tedious data collection when it's one of the most important parts of the process. It's just not one of the creative parts of the process. So it kind of is one of those things that's felt like someone else's fault or someone else's problem. And it's tough to get people to realize it's their problem. It's sort of to piggyback on what um, what the guy said too, with students, they often are only working by themselves and they aren't considering collaboration. And these best practices help with collaborating between creators. I mean, I'm the same way in a lot as Matt. There's a lot of projects going on, a lot of multiple things going on. And to have that workflow organization and everything backing up and archiving as I as I go each day that I know it's not only on a server, but also in the cloud. And I've got it three places. But even if you're a songwriter writing all the songs by yourself over a few years, you're going to come upon something where somebody's going to go, you know, that I, I got that demo from three years ago. I want to use that in a movie and I need the stems from you. And you're going, oh, gosh, where did I put that? How did I organize it? Can I find it quick? Because they need it tomorrow. So it doesn't matter if you've got a big studio and a lot of things going on or just one person. You still need to be able to find those files and recognize them quickly and know that they're safe and in in three places, preferably. Absolutely. I want to add one thing, if I could put a finer point on that as well said, Jeff, is students new practitioners don't understand the importance of backups until they lose big files, until they lose a session. And then it, boy, it comes home to you. Why didn't I back that up? Mm-hmm. Um, and until that happens, because that's the, that's the lesson that we've all learned, I'm afraid, as many times as we were told to back up our work, we've learned by uh, making that big mistake of not doing it. That's right. The worst call you can ever make is to somebody and say, hey, I lost your song. We have to do that again. Because you may have lost that song, but you probably also lost a client. You know, if you can't be trusted with someone's art, they're not going to come back to you. But as Jeff is saying, if you can go and find that file quickly and save the day, you got a client for life. That's how you keep the relationships with your artists. I think it's, uh, I think it's just always a safe place to assume that hard drives will fail. Mm. The question is when. Not will it or won't it? So if it's only in the one place, I think George said this once, if it's only in one place, then it's already lost. And if it's only in two places, you're renting it. If it's in three places, you got it covered. Like that's really how you got to think about it. And, and I lost a file that I had to pay thousands of dollars for drive savers to, to find. And, and luckily they were able to find it. And it was the only backup of an entire album's worth of mix files. And I got it back. This, I don't want to name it. I literally got it back 20 minutes before the artist called requesting files. And I learned the hard way at that point, like, okay, well, we're going to invest in a backup scheme. And that's just how it's been ever since. That's so important. But what always amazes me these days, having been an engineer, but not being one now, is how much you have to manage in terms of every, you know, every part that was sent to you by the guitar player in Paris, every a demo mix you made, every rough mix you made, just because the artist is going to come and say, remember that day, remember that thing I did. And you all are responsible or have to sit there and produce it and say, yeah, I can find that. I can do it. That's a lot. Easy to go and say, like, I'll organize this later. But that never really happens. And so we're trying to implement systems that are just as easy as I'll just put this here and organize it later so that there's a system that's simple to use. Yeah, I hear from so many engineers of the time they spend after the client leaves, taking the notes that they scribbled and putting them somewhere where they can find them again. And all that information that they didn't have time to enter during the session. Um, Um, Speak of scribbles. Oh, does somebody have something else they wanted to add? Yeah, if I could, I wanted to go back and echo something that Leslie said about collaboration. You know, now so many people are working on their laptops in their room or their studio and sending files to someone else and all over the all over the globe and so that makes file management and naming conventions that much more important. If you get guitar 6 or audio 22 from some other country, we have no idea what that means and sifting through and figuring out what 
audio 22 actually is, is not a good use of anybody's time, not a good use of your studio time, the clients, their billing, whatever it takes. Our job is to make things smooth and easy and transparent. Figuring out what files are is none of that. Speaking of scribbles, um, we've got a few slides here to show some of what we've been working on. Our work ends up in a document, although it's going to be an interactive and much more accessible document than it has been in the past when we're done with this revision. This one is from 2018, the last time it was revised. And this is what we were looking at as a file hierarchy that encompassed pretty much everything you need to save and organize. We'll go to the next slide, which is as we dug into it with this new committee <laughs> this year to see what we needed to add or subtract or how things were going with files. This is what we ended up with. And then after a little more talking about it, we went to this. Just a quick glance at all the things and all the notes we had. Here was our third attempt at covering everything. And what we finally ended up with was two sets of file hierarchy, which is the working project folder hierarchy, which goes on throughout your project. Take a quick look at that. And then this is the delivery project folder hierarchy. I know it looks daunting, but it's less daunting than probably some of the alternatives. So let's go back to the questions. What are your pet peeves about the files that you are all sent to work on? How much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, pet peeves, pet peeves. Yeah. I'll start by, the one for me is everything, every file in the session needs to start at zero. Um, I've had times where files come in, they start at different places, and then I'll have rappers say, well, you changed my flow, it's a little early, it's a little late. Well, I don't necessarily know how you wrapped the song if I'm just mixing it. If everything, every file is consolidated and starts from zero, it doesn't matter what DAW people are working in, it doesn't matter if I know the song or not, I can just start everything from the top and I know I'm not gonna change anyone's flow or move a guitar or solo, and I don't have to guess what the musicians intended, I can just make it sound good. I'll jump in. I mean, naming, let's just start with naming. Can we, can we just get the files all named? I get so many sessions in that are just every track labeled audio one dot dupe one dot two six four three nine seven and it makes putting these things together extremely difficult because then not only is the file that it was recorded to all just called audio one dot insane number string afterwards it, it becomes really hard to organize afterwards and then going downstream when something needs to be referenced from the original session the client is saying like oh we're missing this hi-hat and i say okay cool what was that track called and they're like oh it's audio 3.96275 like we can't you can't find it so just a simple pass at going through before mix time ideally while recording but um before file gets shipped out a pass at naming everything so there's some sort of organization uh, that we can reference from would be incredible. The other thing though, is that sometimes people take that too far and they start doing premix cleanup for the mixer. And this kills me the most because oftentimes they sonically change the session from the approved rough at that point. And the cleaned up session that I get that they think they're doing me some sort of big favor no longer sounds like the approved ref mix. And that can create really massive headaches when the artist doesn't understand why the session sounds different and there's no way to go back and we have to go back to the messy session to start over. So just the earlier you can get on file organization and naming so that the session that goes out at the end is both the approved session and an organized session, that would be a, a, a huge step forward. Jumping in on what Matt's talking about, a lot of this stuff in the revision of this document you're going to see we've addressed, and there's a lot of great information in this new version. If you're importing WAV files into a session, if you number them, and if it's drums, bass, whatever, you start with one and you number them in order. If you put the one first, you'll import into the session in order that you have it. So uh, little things like that. But I'll talk about Atmos file delivery, because that's something that varies widely right now. 
And if you're not mixing from a multi-track, if you're getting stems in for that most mix, a very detailed stem print is really needed to take advantage of the immersive space in Atmos and 360 and the other formats. So that's important. If you're going to group them, you can group them logically. If it's guitar, strums, stem, guitar, rhythmic stuff, stem. I mean, you can group some things together, but really preferably it is separate, even kick and snare separate. A lot of producers that don't understand immersive mixing and engineers that may not be quite a fan of it or either understand it want to only send six stems because they think they're protecting their product. And actually, they're harming their product because they're not going to get a, get a great representation in an immersive format of that album project. So that's a big one. Let's hit, hear a few more. And then I want to go to a slide that shows some suggested naming conventions to part of what you guys have been saying. But Leslie, anything you want to bring up? For me, it's naming conventions and consistency, really. Everything that everyone has said, but consistency and naming conventions, and also superfluous tracks. If it doesn't belong in the mix, I don't want it. Yeah. I don't want it. How am I supposed to know if it belongs or not? If you send it to me, I'm going to assume it belongs. Right. And that's, yeah. yeah. That. Yep. Man, I get, that's I a get nightmare. That's, I get that so much. Well, why is that vocal in there? Well, you sent it to me. How do I know that it doesn't go in the song? Why did you give it right. to me? Yeah. And then it can be so contradictory, right? Because in song A, you only use the stuff that's unmuted, and then you get to song B, and they're like, oh, it's missing the background vocals. Well, they, you muted them. Oh, that was an accident. And now everything is just like, well, now I don't know what's muted, what's not muted, what's supposed to be there. Like, Because no consistency. Yeah. No consistency. That, yeah, the consistency. Once I can't trust one file, I can't trust any of the any files. Any file. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring up what somebody said to me once about what best practices are. And they said, best practices are just being considerate of the next person down the chain in making the record. That's good. Yeah. Um, and let's take a cyclical chain because of collaboration. So we're sending yeah. files and doing so many things. So much collaboration goes on these days. So many parts and pieces. So could we see that, um, that naming convention slide? Anybody want to comment on this? I'll just comment, while it may look like a lot, it's all the pertinent information that is necessary. The file names may start to get long, but everything in here is something that's critical information. So it's just kind of, it is what it is. So don't let this be daunting to you. It's just the job. Someone has to keep it organized, and that's part of the engineering part. And I'll just say, this is a basic recommended naming convention if you need a little more detail of, for something to be clear add it to it you know yep it's important that it's understood when it's received by somebody exactly what it is we have a copy of these and even more examples of naming conventions on note cards taped to every workstation surface uh, throughout the facility so that anybody who sits down can physically see how they're supposed to be naming something. And even if it's their second day at the studio working, they literally can just look at it and understand what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to name things. I mean, it's even on the console in front of me so that I don't forget. And there's so many ways to streamline this process now to make this easy. There are sound flow scripts you can write that literally ask you a bunch of questions and then generate the, the file name for you. Like there really is no excuse to not at least try and get this right. and Trust me, you're doing five years from now, you, such a favor when you properly and consistently name things so that when you have to go back five, six, seven years, and we are going back way further than that now, having to go through to do immersive stuff for stuff that's decades old, the sooner you get on a consistent naming system like this, the better off you're going to be, the easier it's going to be able to find things. Even just using the artist initials thing and keeping a database of all the artists you've worked with and the codes that you've used to title their stuff across their catalog, even that alone will put you ahead. To piggyback on that, even before mixes and before stems, as you're working in your DAW, every time you open your project to work on it, to do a save as with a name modifier that says what you're doing is just yep version control and covering your rear end. It's so important. You Absolutely. can use your brain to apply these concepts to other aspects of the working project. 
In our last incarnation of this project, we actually created a, a laminate that some people use in their studios. And one side showed our suggested file hierarchy. And they're just suggestions. You know, we're not telling everybody this is how you have to do things. It's just, look, we came up, a bunch of people, many people came together talking about how they do their projects. And from that, we created these things. We didn't just make them up out of nowhere. It had the naming conventions on one side and the other side was some suggested file hierarchies. So. But Matt's got him taped all over the studio. That way everything's right. And I don't have to get mad. <laughs> all right. We could take that slide down for now. I just want to speak to like the, yeah. the, the, the complicatedness, the, the inherent thought process of the complicatedness of the, the folder hierarchy as well. And having been lucky to have been enough to have been on the committee that put that together the first time, I will say before I went through that process, we had a much simpler version of the way we were organizing and storing things here. And I immediately said, okay, we're changing it. We're going to put everything into this hierarchy now. And every one of my staff pushed back. They were like, oh, this is such a pain in the ass. I don't want to do this. This is so complicated. And now five, seven years into that process, it's become so second nature that no one complains. And when we have to go back to things that existed before we used the file hierarchy, now everyone complains because it's not organized and it's not as clean and simple to find the things. And so we've, we've completely flipped in the arc of five years of complaining for the extra work to complaining that we haven't been doing the extra work the whole time. So saving a copy of that folder structure to your desktop, writing an Apple script to create it, any way you can do it to make it simple and recreatable, I cannot recommend that enough and to develop that habit as soon as you can uh, across all of your projects. Yeah, it may take a little more work now, but I mean, this stuff, it's Trust self-care. Me. It's self-care. Yeah. You're going to thank yourself later on when you, because, you know, I have a small studio. I have a very small staff and I do most of the things. I can't remember everything I did. I can't remember last week that well, never mind a record from five, 10 years ago. So I need to set myself up for success by making it clear now. And I can't tell you how many engineers have told me that the artist calls them. What happened with that? Where is it? It's you, the engineers that they rely on to help them out when they didn't organize things. Well, let's talk about stems a little bit if we have time. I hope we do, because they're a big deal these days. Can we kind of concisely talk about stem printing processes and what you take into account when you're printing stems? I think I probably have the most complicated For, one. <laughs> when, uh, we should just be clear about what is a stem and what is well, a Well, how about we just start with the basics? Yeah. Sometimes artists or independent people, maybe less experienced engineers, will send you files and call them stems, but they're actually multi-tracks. Labels are confused about the difference too often. So multi-track is what you recorded, and stem is a version of that that is part of the final presentation, I would say. Is there, does somebody else have a better way to describe stem? <laughs> Once you have a stereo mix and you print stems of that stereo mix, it's whether it's one instrument or a group of same instruments as guitars, drums, uh, if you want to group them together, but it would contain all the processing used in the mix, the stereo mix. So you print that vocal with all the effects, everything, the compression, the EQ, same with drums, bass, et cetera. And you, when you put the stems all up as zero, you're, you're you know, 97% to the original mix, depending on if you're using sidechain compression um, for the master, stereo master, stuff like that. The sum of the stems should equal the final mix. Correct. Uh, uh, mo- close. Uh, as close, close as you can get. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, and the multi tracks are the assets you're using to create stems. To create the mix and create the stems. I get some people, I'll send you the stems to mix. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't want that. I want the individual assets <laughs> so I can create the mix for you. I'll jump in here. We're, uh, so we're mixing on the analog console. Here still fully out of the box uh, with stuff in the box as well too. And so the stem printing process for us is kind of argu- arduous. Uh, we are every single track that's on the console is being separated. So if we have a live drum kit, that is kick, snare, hat, rack tom, floor tom, mid tom, the overheads go down as a stereo pass. Every set of rooms goes down as a single pass. Every discrete instrument goes down as a single analog print through in real time for the duration of the song. That is inclusive of mix bus compression, which we could talk about for four hours. So we're, I'm going to gloss over that. But then also any time-based effects, 
we try and uh, print separately as well. So if there's a guitar part that has reverb on it, we print the guitar dry and then we print the reverb, all of this in real time. So it's, it's really time consuming. But at the end of that process, we have a new session that is all, as Jeff said, faders at zero that equals the console mix that can then be very easily revised on any workstation when the client calls and wants a kick drum up or a snare drum down or a lead vocal up revision, these then become offline balances that can be done by any one of my staff from any rig throughout the facility. So that streamlines the, the back and forth between analog and, and digital for us, as well as sets us up perfectly for the immersive mix because all of the uh, instruments are already separated perfectly for that and exist in a wet dry situation. It does it take a lot of time. Absolutely. It's about two to two and a half hours per song, but it's something that I think is very important to generate. So, you know, I invest time in that. There's, um, you know, there's some, some great information in the document for folks once they read that, uh, that has to do with uh, how much analog noise you have on your plugins. If you have the analog section button in to uh, side chaining the stereo compression, bus compression. So check out the document for that. Jeff, can you just clarify what that document is again? We've been talking about so much. Uh, it's the delivery recommendations document that the PE Wing has. Yeah, you can find that on the you can find the 2018 version on producers and andengineers.com. Just scroll down to technical guidelines. It's outdated now, but it does have a lot of tips and tricks that are not outdated still in it. So hopefully coming soon, because we're nearing the end of our review of it. We will have a version of it that isn't just a document, but is more interactive. The document is so well worth reading, if you can. Every time I read it, I go, wow, this stuff's great. But you do have to read it. So we're... <laughs> right. And you do not have to be a member, right? To, to Oh, no, no. It. You just go right. producers and A-N-D, engineers.com, technical guidelines, delivery recommendations for recorded music projects. It's got a great history. It's got a long history, but we're not going into that now. We've got a couple more questions. How much? Well, before, Maureen, before we move on, I want to yeah. highlight how important it is to print those stems too for non-analog processes. I know like as I walk through my process, it makes a lot of sense because I'm in the analog domain to print all those stems. But I think it's really important for people to realize that even if they're in the box, that those stems still need to be generated because we're constantly in a fluid state of plugins updating, going to end of life. When they do update, Sometimes you have to forfeit your asset to get the update and the new plugin doesn't sound the same auto tune. Uh, <laughs> and so if you've not locked your stems in and you think like, Oh, you know, five years from now, I'm just going to be able to, you know, hit command O and open this mix up and it's going to be the same. It's not. And we've already gone through one major upheaval where we have pro tools documents that are not physically just not openable ever again. And that's just been in the last 15 years. So think about things on a 50 year arc. We're having to pull up stuff that's that old at this point you know, to do immersive. So, like, think about that. You got to print these stems. It does not exist in a reusable format if you have not printed this as a consolidated wave with all of your production decisions baked into it so that it can be reopened in any DAW, in any format without needing plugins for it to sound the right way. If you're not doing that, the data, it just doesn't exist forever then. Hard earned advice. How much of collecting and documenting credits and other recording metadata do you take responsibility for? And do you work with a label or management in that process of collecting and organizing? I can go ahead and jump in. I work mostly in the independent sphere. So either completely independent artists or small labels, um, all of whom tend to lean on me as the studio to manage all of these things, keep backups, keep track of data. Random artist 17 from Brooklyn may not be up on all the things that we're talking about now. And so it's someone's responsibility. It doesn't fall to no one. These things are important. So it often falls to me. If there's a label, I'm checking with the label of the artist. I'm getting all the information I can uh, because at the end of the day, I'm holding a lot of the data. So I have to take that responsibility. I usually work with uh, either production assistants or the label or the producer. Uh, and making sure the credits of the section of the project that I work on, whether it's mixing or whatever, I make sure my team that's around me is definitely documented and uh, credited. 
lately, the Producers and Engineers Wing has worked on the crediting problem for ever, practically, ever since we went from analog to digital and credits were kind of went away with digital to start with. They're slowly crawling back, but they're not back. The way records are made today, everybody has a responsibility. Everybody on the project has a responsibility from the artist to the engineer, to the producer, to, of course, the people at the labels to document this information as best as you can and pass it along the chain. It's not easy at the labels for them to get the information. As we've been talking about parts and pieces that come from all over the world, potentially, the credits are like that too. And you may be working on a project that moves on to someone else to record and someone else to mix. And everybody needs to do their best to make sure that the information that they have gets passed on. That's not a very efficient answer. But it seems to be where we are right now. As we were talking about before we went on air, some services like Tidal really do a pretty good job of showing credits, but they do that by combining all sorts of different ways of finding those credits because there isn't a central source. There probably isn't going to be a central source (laughs) in a long time or maybe not in our lifetimes, but we can all do our best to make sure that everybody gets credited like they should be. I would say just never assume that someone else is doing it. Either do it or ask the people around you to make sure it's getting done. Yeah. It's a good life mantra for, for engineers, right? Never yeah, assume I know, somebody that's else what did I was that thinking. job. That's, just, that's the engineer's <laughs> job anyway. Never assume part of your job anyway is never assume someone else is doing it. All right, let's just close with a question of what would you consider the most impactful information in our delivery recommendations that we've been working on? It's all great stuff, but is there anything that you think is most impactful or most important as a takeaway? I think for me, it's been the naming conventions. I've always tried to be pretty good about it, but I always just kind of went along thinking, well, I'm doing everything here. So I know what that is, but... I'm human, I get sick or whatever. I may want to go on vacation and be unavailable and records still need to get made. So just getting organized like that and just getting in the cycle of doing all the proper naming conventions for me has already paid off where I've had to go back. Oh, I mixed this album a month ago, but I have to go and do this revision quick last second. I can do it quick last second and not dig around and spend my whole day trying to find whatever version of that song it was. So. The naming stuff is just super, super critical for me. To that point, part of our recommendations for the naming conventions is thinking about illegal characters in certain formats. So that was a good takeaway for me. Like, I know not to use certain characters, but some of the consistency in the recommendations are like building a wall around the possibility of some other OS not being able to read this. Yeah, when you name your song, smiley face emoji, thumbs up emoji, everything just... (laughs) It becomes a disaster. You got PTSD. <laughs> I didn't mean to trigger you. Sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I think that, um, yeah, I think that we have to realize that with all of these great tools and with all of these great new ways that we have to create, that this process has become more complicated and not less complicated, right? There are so many more moving parts today in a large format project than in years past. There are so many places where the documentation can break down. There's so many places where the thing can just completely come off the rails by one bad decision that got made by somebody who just wasn't paying attention that day. And so in looking at documents like these, even if you don't incorporate, I mean, and it's, you're going to look at it and it's a lot, it's a lot of pages and it's a lot of dense stuff in there. And even if you don't incorporate every single thing today, looking at it on a repeated basis to just keep in your head all of these possible moving pieces, all of the things that go into properly executing a recording project these days, just to keep all that in your head and understand all of that. Like That's something you can take away. You're going to find something new every single time you go through the document, just reviewing it every once in a while and going, oh, I've got this under control. Let me add this. Or, oh, I totally forgot about this. And just, just being familiar with all of the process and all of those facets of, of what goes into making a project, that's, I think, for me, one of the most important parts of the document. It's just, it's a lot. It's definitely not what it used to be. I think well we said. have to remember, we have to remember that our job is to manage complexity. Oh. It's a really complex workflow. It's a complex environment. 
And the more we try to escape from that and assigning that responsibility to someone else and not taking it on ourselves to understand it, the more trouble we get into. It's a business of managing complexity. Take yeah. it home, Jeff. Take it home, Jeff. Uh, I think that I think Matt and George summed it up. It just did. That, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. I want to thank uh, David Weiss and MixCon for this opportunity to bring all of these people together. Such fun, such wisdom, such experience. David. Wow. This was legendary. Thank you, Maureen. This is really what MixCon is all about, is sharing information, getting it from the top pros, people who've been there and really have something to say about how all the other engineers can benefit from your experience. So I want to second what you said, Maureen. Thank you all for taking the time to be here to share what you know. And, and this ended up where I want to, which is like, how do you get your heads around this and, and how do you just get started? improving file management. I think the takeaway from anyone watching this is it's a journey <laughs> and an adventure to get better at this, but it just keeps on paying off. So everyone who's watched this, thanks for watching it. Watch it again. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to we're gonna make links available to these documents uh, in the comments. So thank you all one more time for taking part, for being here today to our viewers, our MixCon attendees uh, here in the Sonic Scoop delicious audio audience. Thank you. There's lots more all around the internet from us. So join us and have a great day. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you, David. Bye, thank Dan. you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye, guys. you all.